pleasure to introduce to you Jim Ross, who is the agriculture editor of KMA Ro Radio out of Shenandoah, Iowa. Jim, please. Thank you, President Woodland, and good morning, everybody. I guess everyone got a good night's sleep, right? Some young guy was in the room next to me, and this girl kept hollering and screaming and raising cane, and I met him in the hall this morning. I said, what was all that noise last night? And he said, oh, he said, this gal kept beating on my door. And I said, well, how'd you finally quiet her down? He said, I got up about three and let her out. I'm not sure which one of you that was. Uh, we had a little trouble getting out here, I guess, like most of you did. This has been kind of a busy week. Normally, we like to come and spend the entire duration of our time at the convention, from the opening bell to the final gavel. However, some other commitments uh, forced us to stay in Iowa. Uh, I gave a speech to the pork producers over in Auburn, Nebraska, on the uh, Tuesday, yeah, what is today? Thursday? Yeah, Tuesday night. And we grabbed a flight out here Wednesday, and as soon as we finish this morning, we have to uh, leave as there's a meeting over in Guthrie Center that we have to be to this evening. But uh, I used uh, Midwest Airlines coming out here. <laughs> oh, I tell you. We got on an airplane in Omaha, and they taxied out the end of the runway. They sat there for about a half an hour, taxied back in. The crew got off. They got back on, we went back out, we sat there another 30 minutes, went back in, the crew got off, got back on again, went back out, this time we took off. Finally landed out here at Stapleton in a cloud of snow, and I ran into the pilot in the lobby at the airport, and I said, what in the world was going on back in Omaha? As I'm a flight instructor, and I know a little bit about airplanes, I said, the weather was clear, I, I don't understand, we sat there a half an hour, you guys went in, you got off, you got back on. Well, he said we were having a slight problem. He said the engines didn't sound very good. And he says at Midwest Airlines, safety is our primary concern, so we went back in and changed pilots. <laughs> well, that's how we got here. I was going to introduce Phil Allen to you this morning, but there isn't anything I can say about him he hasn't already said about himself. <laughs> Where is Phil? He's one of our friends. We like to pick on him a little bit. Phil, you know, Phil's a pretty deep fellow. Got a lot of intellect. We were talking the other day and talking about the farm program and the recession and all the problems that we're facing now. And I said, Phil, what do you think the problem is? Is it ignorance or apathy? Phil said, you know, I said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> You got to think about that one a minute. But he did make a real outstanding remark, though, and catch this now. He says you can observe a lot just by looking. <laughs> and I'm in trouble when the next here's info hits the mail. <laughs> Go ahead, Phil, we'll play it, and we don't care. <laughs> the comments I'm going to make this morning are personal, and as Mr. Woodland said, basically some observations on your organization from an outsider's viewpoint. Uh, I'm not going to be stumping for any political candidate, and I will inject some of my own personal feelings as we go along. I think it's very important that you understand where my personal bias lies. I think it's important that you understand the personal bias of any newspaper editor, any writer, any person on television or on radio that you watch or listen to, because we're human beings, and regardless of how middle of the road, how apolitical, as Johnny Carson likes to say, that we try to stay, unconsciously we're going to color things just a little bit along the direction that we believe in. I think that's human nature. I've been in this business for 16 or 17 years just in the broadcast side, and to this date I have never met anyone that I felt could walk right down the middle of the road 100% of the time. 
A lot of it goes back to your background. I'm a farm boy. I was born in southwest Iowa. My folks still live there. Dad's idea of retirement was selling the livestock. <laughs> He's 73. He still farms 160 acres. He said he wants to wear out instead of rust out. <laughs> but as a kid, we lived on a general farm. We farmed about, well, we had 160 we owned. We rented enough, so we had around 800 acres altogether. We didn't have a hired man. We did it with some well-used two-row equipment. We had about 40 head of cows that we kept around in a cow herd, raised our own calves, and we fared out six to 700 head of hogs a year. And most of that was done in those little A-frame hog houses. There's many a March night we sat out there with a kerosene lamp and a gunny sack wiping those little boogers off so they wouldn't freeze to death. Ain't farming fun. <laughs> Our chief crop was corn, raised a little wheat, a little bit of oats. At alfalfa we used in a rotation program, which I still think we need some more of that in this day and age. <laughs> At that time, all of our grain went to market as either beef or pork. In fact, Walt Hackney, who heads up your livestock division, used to buy fat cattle from us when he worked for MVP. Well, at least he told him he was working for him. <laughs> he got a check, we guess. I attended school in a little town of Farragut, Fremont County in Iowa. Not a very big place. We doubled the population when school was in session. We, uh, a lot of towns still like that. We had a coach there. You know, I think a lot of what happens is how you think about things. This guy is one of the most negative people I've ever seen. You know, we went nine years and never won a football game, and he was down-faced, and I can't understand that. <laughs> One year, we, he won the toss. It was a kickoff. The ball was in the air, and he said, wait till next year. <laughs> the guy was just negative. You know? My senior year, the last game of the season, we played Hamburg. At that time, we were playing six-man football, and uh, the score was... 97 to nothing, two minutes to go in the fourth quarter, and we kind of knew the pressure was on. <laughs> it's about a minute and a half left to go, and some kid in a hot rod out in the parking lot backfired the son of a gun. The Hamburg team thought it was a gun that signaled the end of the game, and they left the field. <laughs> and we scored three plays later. on a field goal. <laughs> it was partially blocked. <laughs> Farragut's a nice little town. It's like most of our small communities. We used to have a hotel there volunteer fire department it caught on fire one night it burned down they couldn't figure out how to get a hose through a revolving door <laughs> they're going to put a signal light in next week I still go down there once in a while and they had a meeting they were going to put in a traffic light they met last week to pick out the colors <laughs> opened a massage parlor last winter it's self-service <laughs> What did I tell you, Devon? They're going broke, but they can still laugh. <laughs> uh, our fire department was something else. I live in Shenandoah, which is about six miles away, and we had a, a big grass fire a couple years ago, and the wind was blowing the doggone thing towards town. And we had our fire department, Red Oak, we'd called in quite a few of them. They were fighting this blaze, and it was just going nowhere. The fire was gaining all the time. So they called Farragut. They remembered that, you know, they did have a fire department. So here the guys come in this 1937 truck down the hill. They don't stop at the edge of the fire where the rest of the firemen are. They roll right out in the middle of this fire. 
These guys jump off, they start beating on it, and pretty soon they had to fire out. So the mayor of our fair city said, well, he said, gentlemen, he said, I don't know what it was, but in your training, we guess you learned something these other folks didn't because you know what to do to put the fire out. We're going to give you $500 for your fire department. What are you going to do with it? Fire chief says they're going to fix the brakes on that darn truck. <laughs> gave our fireman a test one time. He said, what happens if you hear the siren at 3 o'clock in the morning? One guy said, I get up and I feel the wall. If it's cold, <laughs> so if it's cold, I just go back to bed. <laughs> I enlisted in the Army after I got out of high school, which gives you some indication of where my intelligence lies. <laughs> after serving Uncle Sam, went to University of Iowa for a while, ran out of money, and uh, went to work for IBM as a customer engineer. 1961, became involved in commercial radio, moved back to Shenandoah, took a six-year hiatus from uh, about 70 to 76, and moved to Texas, and uh, opened a plant for the Farm Master Company. Maybe some of you used to buy gates off of them. And we were doing pretty well down there, and they sold out to the Wicks Corporation, and you know what happened to them. They rolled over and their feet went in the air. So we moved back to Iowa. By the way, if you go to Texas, you got to either be a Dallas Cowboy or a Houston Oiler fan. I mean, that's one of the prerequisites for citizenship in that state. Where are the Texas folks? They here? Right? They're not here? We can talk about them. All right. No. You know why there's a hole in the roof of Texas Stadium? That's so God can watch his favorite team on Sunday. Uh, that's Texas. But anyway. I'm married, we have four children. One's a married daughter. We got a daughter that's a freshman at the University of Iowa. Another girl's a freshman in Shenandoah in high school. And a little boy that's in the first grade. And I hope we're done. <laughs> Every time I walk home, my wife says, I have a surprise for you. I just go into cardiac arrest. <laughs> Walked in the other night. I'd really been beat. I'd been on one of these trips. I was tired, I was worn out. I walked in the house, I could see the look in her eyes that something was wrong. And I said, honey, I don't care what it is, I don't want to hear it. You know, it's, it's been, I've been on the road for two days, all I want is a little bit of rest. And she said, well, look at it this way. You got four kids and three of them don't have a broken arm. <laughs> That's the positive approach. <laughs> we own three small businesses, a uh, seasonal ice cream store in Shenandoah. And about four years ago, when the economy was, I guess, at the bottom, my wife got a real wild idea that she wanted to open a ladies' lingerie store. And the business is so bad, we opened the second one up in Atlantic two years ago, and it's doing quite well. Sometimes people say, what do you do besides broadcasting? And I tell them I'm an undercover agent. But being in business on Main Street, as well as, as working with you folks in the farm industry, we know the agonies of 21% money and barring to stay afloat, many of the needless regulations that we're all saddled with. You know, as a kid in Fremont County, if you wanted to put up hay, it was no big deal. You got a bunch of neighbor kids to come work for you. This day and age, your first problem, you gotta find a kid that wants to work. But if you get past that point, you get him out on the farm, he has to be a certain age, you have to pay a certain wage. If he's going to be around a pitchfork, he has to wear iron-toed shoes and have an indoctrination speech on how dangerous the pitchfork is. Hard hat if there's anything above his shoulders that could drop on him. And according to the Federal Register, and this isn't the story, it's true. If you've got more than three employees, you're supposed to have a portable john out in the field for him. It's ridiculous. When I was a kid, the only thing you had to worry about that John was to watch out for the smart weed. <laughs> Apparently there's a couple of you that didn't. <laughs> well, Paul Harvey once described us in the, the news business as professional parade watchers. And I really think it's a pretty good description. And this morning, 
We're going to talk about watching the NFO parade. I intend to shoot from the hip, and I hope that what I have to say doesn't offend anyone. But keep in mind that I believe farmers, all farmers, are the most important people on the face of this earth. You people really are. Life itself requires air, water, and food, and you provide one-third of that vital formula. And without it, without any one of those ingredients, life would cease to exist. Statistics will show us that each of you people feed 78 other folks. That's a national average. In the state of Iowa, we're a little bit better than that. Each one of our farmers feeds 278 people. Friends, you're definitely VIPs. I don't have the national statistics on jobs, but in Iowa, each farm worker creates 5.2 jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, those figures are important for a lot of reasons. Basically, they translate into billions and billions and billions of dollars. You know, out here in the country, we felt this economic recession coming on long before the rest of the country even realized that our world economy was right on the edge of being in a lot of trouble. And it's my firm belief that the agricultural economy of this country must be repaired properly before we can expect any kind of global economic regrowth of a permanent nature. You've got to get well first, and then the rest of the country. And I don't think that it's any big secret that our problem is not production, it's marketing. A lot of people have tried a lot of different things, and a lot of them haven't worked. But I think the important thing is that we have tried. You know, if we keep trying, we'll eventually get something done. It's like the old drunk that was walking home one night and he took a shortcut through the cemetery and he fell in an open grave. He kept trying to get out and trying to get out and he couldn't. Pretty soon another drunk came through the cemetery and fell in the grave with him. He took long with one look at him and he was out in a single bound. <laughs> and he just kept trying. If you don't mind, I think we can compare the growth of your NFO organization with that of a child. Your organization first saw the light of days about 28 years ago, like 1955. And that was a year that really wasn't too different from the one we've just gone through. Drought, low prices, farm foreclosures were pretty much in the headlines. Those first few years, you tried to improve federal farm programs. But much like a child in diapers, about the only thing you got changed was yourself. It didn't work too well. By 1958, the NFO baby had learned to walk and talk enough to be recognized. And collective bargaining became a big part of your word vocabulary. And you tried out those new words on anyone that would listen. And not too many did. So like a child has just learned to walk and wants to try those new skills, you tried to run. And as a result, you bumped into a lot of tables, you broke quite a few dishes and even an heirloom vase or two. The holding actions, the milk dumpings, the hog kills of the late 50s and 60s did, and I underline did, dramatize the gravity of the farm situation at that time. But like the child, accidentally breaking mom's best china, you created a lot of negative feeling that you're still combating today. Many members of the news media viewed the NFO as a loud, clumsy child just yelling for attention. And in those days of high emotion, some wounds were opened that still haven't healed completely and some healed with a bit of scar tissue. But like a vibrant youngster, you lived through that. And you went through those tough teenage years. And like teenagers, you had a pretty good time. I remember going to your conventions. They were loud, noisy affairs. One that uh, 
believe it was Louis or St. Louis, Missouri. I didn't have a room reservation. I slept in one of the display rooms one night. It was the only place that was left in the hotel. A lot of money was spent. And once again, some of the news people became upset over such things as not being able to plug their recorders in at your convention because all the county committee chairmen had all the, the plug-ins taken up. They weren't used to that sort of thing. Organizations, they felt, don't do it this way. That was their bias. But I think the one thing that they really missed, the point that was missed, and that that was really a demonstration of the true grassroots nature of the NFO. You as individuals were interested in your organization and you're willing to put in your time to see what happened. And basically, I think in, in the growth structure at that point, as an organization, you were starting to mature. The uh, strength of any organization, I don't care what it is, and in Iowa, we could use the pork producers as an example, comes from the bottom up. And that's where you started. And then you have to find a good leader to keep it together. The thing that amazes me about the NFO, you know, there's an old saying that a camel is really a horse that was designed by a committee. <laughs> and when you look at the size of your board of directors, and you get this many people together and can come up with some good solid answers to get something done, that in itself is a miracle. I can't get along with my wife. <laughs> By 1979, NFO had pretty much finished high school and enrolled in college. At this point in time, Orrin Lee gave up the reins to the new kid on the block, Devon Woodland. And that freshman year for Devon was kind of a tough one. He had danced quite a while and the time had come to pay the band. I think Mr. Woodland addressed that in his opening remarks earlier in the convention. But to me as an outsider looking in, it appeared that the NFO was starting to take college very seriously. And an air of business had settled around almost everyone's shoulders. Those very important years of growing up were starting to slip behind and a new mature NFO was walking the streets in a business suit. In the next few years, we saw those old debts being quietly worked off. An excellent staff, in my opinion, of some of the brightest marketing minds in the country has been assembled in a little town called Corning, Iowa. I think your staff is tremendous. <laughs> At this point, the NFO was pretty much finishing up their graduate work and writing a thesis for their doctorate. Hampered by a weak economy and some farmers and media people's negative memories, your organization has now graduated at the very young age of 28. I think you've reached a very important milestone in your history. We've reached a point that, here's another story, you want one? Uh, <laughs> this fella sold fish to the fish market. And they were kind of questioning the fact that every day he came in with more fish than anyone else. His uncle happened to be the sheriff in that small town, so they decided they'd send the sheriff fishing with him one day. They got out in the lake, pulled right out in the middle, the sheriff got his line out, got it out in the water. Elmer reaches down, opens up his tackle box, pulls out a stick of dynamite, lights it, tosses it out in the pond. Kaboom, you know, and the fish all come floating to the top. The sheriff looks at him and says, Elmer, he said, do you realize you've just committed a felony? Elmer reaches in the tackle box, gets a second stick of dynamite, lights it, hands it to the sheriff. He says, you going to talk or fish? I think we've reached a point in time where that stick of dynamite is in your hands today. Are you going to talk or fish? Yeah. 
We're no longer in a U.S. economy. We're involved in a global economy, whether we like it or not. And what happens to us in this country and to people in other countries is very much interrelated. I've been fortunate in this job to have the opportunity to travel a great deal. I've been in Southeast Asia three times in the past two and a half years. And there's one word that we hear battered around that I think has a great misconception, and that word is trade. Trade must be a two-way street. If I buy something off of you, you have to buy something off of me. And too many of our people in powers of position, I think, are looking at the word trade as a one-way deal. I'm going to sell you something, I don't want to buy anything. And it's a very difficult problem, but as figures show us, 52 percent of the soybeans we raise, 70 percent of the wheat, some 30 percent of the corn we raise in our country, we have to sell somewhere else. We just can't eat that much of it. So the alternative is to either cut production or find a way to get rid of it. And that's why I said a while ago, our problem is not production, it's marketing. We have a lot of people. Most of us will go tonight and say a prayer, Dear Lord, please help me stay on my diet. And there's a lot of folks who go to bed tonight, a lot more of them than us. They'll say, Dear Lord, could I please have just one little bowl of rice to eat tomorrow? There are people that want that food. We have to find a way for them to pay for it so you can make a profit. Profit is not a dirty word. Everybody in the chain has to make a profit. You, the producer, the labor that works in the plants, the truck drivers, the processors, the people that own those companies, the retail clerks, the retail stores, everyone has to make a profit. That's the way our system works. I take exception with one of the remarks of the gentleman who spoke before me, that everyone is your adversary. I think everyone in that food chain needs to work together instead of against each other. We look at we look at the packing house business in our corner of the state, and with clear conscience, when we're looking at packing house workers making twenty dollars an hour, guaranteed forty hours a week, which works out to about forty-one thousand six hundred dollars a year, and all the investment they have for their job is in their clothing. And then we look at what you people make with the amount of money that you have invested. I don't really think that's a fair comparison. That's my own opinion. <laughs> Three weeks ago today, I was in Japan as part of the press corps with the president when he made his trip to Japan and Korea. One of the things that he tried to impress upon the Japanese in his address to their national diet, which is the same as our Congress, was that they needed to relax their restrictions on the importation of beef and oranges into Japan. There's about a $20 million deficit or balance of trade in the Japanese favor. Part of that is due to our money being much stronger than the Japanese yen. It's, it's a paperwork thing. But nevertheless, we're buying a lot more from them than they're buying from us. And we need to work on getting that thing balanced out. In Korea, our trading situation there is about even. Uh, the dollars are, are almost identical. It's, it's a good situation there. But one of the problems in Japan, you know, we're talking about cheap food. This is one of the things that got us into a lot of trouble. Please remember that you are the most important people on the face of this earth. Hold your heads up high and be doggone proud that you are a farmer. Your organization offers you a very unique marketing tool, and I urge you to continue on your present path of progress. I'd like to leave you with just ten two-letter words. There's a fellow by the name of Bill Copeland. I heard use this for the first time, and I find that it offers me a lot of strength as I go down the road, and I hope it maybe can offer you something as well. But those ten two-letter words are, if it is to be, it's up to me. Thank you.